How do you see the future of Britain? Do you see it as any rosier than that of America? Because like I said to you before, I lived in London for three years. You know, I do have quite a love for this city. However, it just it gets more and more different every time I see it, and it really doesn't feel like England anymore. And the rate of mass immigration of mostly Islamic people to a Western nation is a recipe for disaster. And I, I don't think that there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel for England, as I can see it. I don't mean to be too black-pilled about it, but I really don't think it's going to go well for Britain. How do you see it? Uh, almost identically, because I actually live here, you know. Mm. Uh, so I was walking Eric Zamora around, for, for those who don't know the the third-place French presidential candidate who got in big trouble for actually reading and reciting what the Great Replacement really means, which mm -hmm. isn't, you know, an anti-Semitic conspiracy yeah, theory. I watched a video about that the other day. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's essentially the blank slate applied to borders. And then, of course, people that have cultural, historical and ethnic baggage against the country they're coming to don't just shed that when they set foot on your soil. So that turns into, I don't know, calling for intifada every week in Westminster, <laughs> for example. Uh, I walked him around Whitechapel um, with my colleague Carl, and he said two things. He said it in French because he refuses to learn English, which I kind of admire, actually. <laughs> he said, the British and the French are old enemies, but at times like these, old enemies must become old friends because Whitechapel is unrecognisable. It looks like an Egyptian slum. There is the East London mega mosque there. There is litter everywhere. It feels like walking through the rubble of the Tower of Babel where everyone speaks different languages. And walking through there as a white Englishman... I was looked at with hostility as if I didn't belong, even though these people have only pitched up for the last 60 years at max and have mm -hmm. terraformed the area. And Zamora also said another thing. He said, you guys once defended yourselves against Napoleon from colonising you. Why did you bother? Because it has happened anyway. Mm. And it very much feels that way in certain areas of London, whether it's the Eritreans duelling like Darth Maul with sticks on Camberwell Road or people at Beckenham Junction attacking each other with machetes on the tube. We are a violent, low-trust civilization now. And much like the black Americans, we've imported the American race politics to say that systemic racism is because you don't have a dad in the home, because you are subsisting on social housing and benefits at my expense, by mm. the way. Um, and this is why you have license to attack and brutalize one another with bladed weapons because somehow the white man is keeping you down. And so if you insulate those people from consequences, one, they don't they see human life as instrumental. They don't see it as uh, sacred. Uh, and two, they don't believe that they will be punished for their transgressions. And if they don't have uh, uh, independent morality, all they fear is consequences. Well, you remove the consequences and you get South Africa, as you said earlier. Yeah. Do you see much hope for Europe as a whole? Because I do see that there are countries like Hungary and Poland that are doing things better. I could see myself potentially moving to Hungary. I love that city, Budapest. But they have a difference in the sense that they're, they have more of a pronounced Christian identity. And they're a little bit more communitarian than we are over here. And they care more about their identity. Like it seems as though British politicians are so self-flagellating that they just want to be the nicest and the wokest and the most friendliest to the immigrants. But now they see the cultural tide turning as is the case with politics. And they see that the will of the people is to want to stop the boats and to want to stop all of these immigrants coming in. Do you see um, Christian Europe having a revival of any sort? There's a lot of components here. So I I might have to go on a sort of lengthy tangent, but I hope it's interesting. It. So I want to coach this in demographics. Paul Morland, himself a, a Jewish Brit, so not exactly a far-right conspiracy theorist, and Philip, Philip Pilkington, a friend of mine, has just moved to Hungary because of its uh, demographic and economic policies, did a paper for Jordan Peterson's ARC called The Demographic Trilemma, and they compared Britain, Japan, and Israel. And they said, you can have two lines of this triangle, but you can't have all three. You can have ethnocultural cohesion, because they are tied. We're not just a nation of ideas. People tell themselves stories, and the stories mm -hmm. are transmitted down family lines. If you break up those family lines, it makes it more easy to indoctrinate people, of course. See Black America. Mm -hmm. uh, high GDP per capita, not just GDP. It's not just line go up. It's people getting independently richer in their families. And low migration, because that's obviously tied to ethnocultural cohesion. Britain has low ethnocultural cohesion. Low GDP per capita, but increasing GDP, even though that's stagnating because mm -hmm. of inflation, and high migration. Japan has low migration, high-ish GDP, but high debt, and high ethnocultural cohesion. Israel has low migration, high GDP per capita, very high birth rates, very high ethnocultural cohesion. And so Paul Morland said, why can't Britain be more like Israel? Because at the moment, if you look at demographic trends, Britain, by 20... 83 will be 54% first generation immigrant. People that arrived yesterday will mean the majority of the country. That is not a country, that is not a culture, that is an economic extraction zone from which you will just have more violence and more hostility and more groups 
coalescing together to become clientele classes of the state begging for resources. We see this in many African countries that can't put together infrastructure projects, as Eric Kaufman has written about. Again, not exactly a far-right conspiracy theorist. And so that is not a place I want to live in. The reason for that is because under the post-war order, Britain has no ethno-cultural identity that has not started from before 1945. Because the Germans did nationalism twice, and that means that we now can't have nationalism ever again. I mean, Joram Pazzoni's written about this, or R. Reno, even Patrick Deneen to an extent. But essentially, the post-war liberal order is anathema to culture. And again, it believes that the blank slate must be believed in as if it is true to stop racism from ever happening, just in case Britain, even though it fought the Nazis, becomes another Third Reich. This is why we're now building a Holocaust memorial next to Parliament, because we must live constantly with the memory in mind of German atrocities to stop of ever, ever becoming the Germans. Ironically, you then import loads of Muslims, which then chant for intifada, and essentially bring it through by the back door, even though the English are never under threat of becoming the Nazis. Mm. The reason that other countries in Europe are looking more promising is because after living under the Soviets, or even under living under what they believe in British occupation in Ireland, they have an ethnocultural identity and is set at odds with the new arrivals, or they've even prevented new arrivals from coming in. Ireland, for example, nation of about 5 million, bring in 100,000 migrants, have a porous border with Northern Ireland, meaning more migrants are pouring over from the UK. They're setting up 10 cities. It's starting to look like San Francisco there. One of them who is meant to have settled there a long time obviously does not integrate because he does not tell his story to himself the same that the Irish tell themselves. And so he stabs a bunch of Gaelic speaking children and a teacher. And the Irish get a bit upset about that, quite understandably. And then they're told, well, you can't speak about that. That's hate speech we're going to censor you. Mm. They don't care because they see themselves in the story they tell themselves as an Irish oppressed people with a particular history and a particular identity. Once they're oppressed by the English, now they are oppressed by what seems to be the denizens of global homogeneity, and so they will fight back against that. The same with the Hungarians. The Hungarians were a distinct people that were incurred upon by the imperial power of the Soviet Union, the uh, sort of like cultural flattening of Marxist uh, imperialism. And now they say, okay, we've suffered under low birth rates for a long time. We see how the global managerial order uses low birth rates to manufacture consent for immigration. There was a Bill and Melinda Gates report recently that said at 2100, only two countries will have positive birth rates. And that's Sierra Leone and I can't remember the other African country. It's in sub-Saharan Africa. And they said, so every country therefore needs to mass import and battery farm Africans ad infinitum. Because again, all people are exactly the same. It's just where they live and the culture they live under, which shapes their identity. So the Hungarians have said, no thanks, close borders. And what we're going to do is we're going to give loans to married couples who get married before their late 30s, I believe it is. I should know this off the top of my head. Mm. Apologies. If you have four children, that loan is completely written off. And for each child you have, a woman loses her income tax by 25% for the rest of her life. So if they have four children, then she has no income tax. For the rest of her life. And that means that after she's raised the children, she can, or while she's raised the children, she can work remote and part-time increasingly. Or after she's raised the children, she can go back to work and support herself and ensure that she's not a burden on the state going into, into the pension years. Because they've made a long-term gamble that the more families they have, the more that are raised in... Christian patriotic Hungary, the more are going to pay back to their civilization, want to stay in it and keep it going along rather than subsisting on the fumes of cultural identity that we do here. And so far, they are the only country which has minorly reversed birth rate decline. No other countries managed to do it at high levels long term. So at least they've made a start. I think it's about 0.2% in 10 years. But most importantly, since 2020, since the since pandemic, when no one was having relationships in every other country in Europe, they're the only country in Europe which has reversed marriage decline. Their marriage rate is doubled. The right. divorce rate is halved. The abortion rate is dropped to two. That's very important. So if culture and politics is an intergenerational project, then those countries are going to win the demographic war, war by having low slash lowering in Ireland migration and eventually more children. 